would be remiss of me, I think, not to acknowledge the elephant that is in the room when Johns Hopkins is in the room around <laughs> genetics and <laughs> genomics. And really, it unfortunately really relates to the topic of what I'm going to talk about today, which is personal and cultural barriers to genomic medicine. Because I think we're all familiar with the story of Henrietta Lacks and the exploitation that happened to her at Johns Hopkins, the money that was made off of the information that was contained in her genetic code, and the way that that contributes to a long legacy of distrust between a lot of marginalized communities and researchers, providers, and others who are working in the field of genomic medicine. So the questions that come to me when I think about these barriers to genomic medicine are, what is the information that's in our genetic code? What does our genome, what does our genome say about us? Is it true? To whom does that information belong? And who benefits from that information? So the question of benefit is, of course, very much tied up with the themes that we've already touched on today, Vince in his wonderful talk and Gwen in, in her introduction. The question of making sure that the benefits of genomic medicine are equally available to everyone, that everyone is able to participate in testing, everyone is able to participate in research, and everyone is able to participate in receiving care for conditions for whatever diseases that we are all struggling with as we make our way through life. Of course, when you think about, as has already been mentioned, the way the United States is set up with our insurance system, the difficulties that so many people have with getting access to insurance coverage, getting access to insurance that actually covers the testing and services and research that we, or uh, treatments that we need, and then making sure that the benefits of these services are equally spread across the country. For many people in this area, they're familiar with the ability to go to some of the best medical institutions in the world for care and treatment, such as the NIH Clinical Center, and we know that there are many, many people across the country who don't have those opportunities. With regard to participation in research, this is something that has also been touched on today, but of course, that's one of the major barriers that we see in the question of how to make sure that genomic medicine reaches all communities. There are many communities who do not want to be part of this research, as Vince alluded to in his presentation. And unfortunately, we know why. So thinking about the question of equality of benefits and making sure that everyone is able to access research, testing, and treatment brings me, as a health disparities researcher, to the question of what role does genomic medicine play in closing health disparities? If you look, for example, at a lot of the strategic plans and research that are out there around health disparities, a lot of them really prioritize genomic medicine, which in many ways is a wonderful thing. We all start from our genetic code. It's a major bedrock of who we are. So what better place to start when we're talking about how to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to live, to thrive, to flourish? But as a health disparities researcher, I also know that paradigm that many of you may be familiar with, the 10, 20, 30, 40. 10% roughly of our health that includes sort of the conditions that we grapple with and also the length of our lives, is related to the medical care that we receive. About 20% is related to genetics, about 30% to behavior, and about 40% to the environments that we live in. So that is not to say that genetics is not important, but it does mean that we need to think about it in the context of those other aspects of our lives and our environments that are structuring our access to care that are structuring the environments in which we are going through our days and living out our lives. And even if you, you know, speaking of some of the sort of more recent advances in genetics and genomic medicine, thinking about questions like epigenetics. What role does our environment potentially play in turning on and off gene triggers that are related to different conditions? Another thing that comes to my mind when we're thinking about this question of what role does genetics play in closing health disparities is this question of how do we think about the individual and the individual's role, and how do we distinguish that from a population level? So a lot of the work that I do has been in LGBT health, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender health. One of the major health issues that has impacted this population, as I'm sure you all are aware, is HIV and AIDS. There's a long been 
a very substantial effort made in the field of HIV and AIDS to ensure that we are talking about the people who are living with HIV as people first, that we are focusing on the people and not on the disease. When we start talking about genomic medicine, we are starting to see this creep towards this idea of pathogenes, similar to pathogens, this idea that people can spread genetically related conditions through parenting, the idea that transmission across generations should somehow be a major focus of genetic medicine in order to not focus on making sure that the individual is healthy and well, but to stop the spread of the disease. That's no way to think about people. The third big thing that comes to my mind around health disparities in genomic medicine is the, probably, I would say, the biggest tension of all. And it's come up uh, already, but I think it's the most critical piece of this to focus on in addition to questions of equality of access. And that is, what do we believe our genes are saying to us about race? Because we are starting to see with 23andMe, for example, this idea, this renewed idea that race is somehow lodged in our genes, which, as we all know, it isn't. The race, the categories that we ascribe to race are socially constructed. There are, of course, commonalities based on where our ancestors came from, but those commonalities are not our racial categories that we have in our society encoded in our genes. So how do we, as researchers, as patient advocates, as patients ourselves, work on recognizing the ways that so many communities, especially communities of color, especially black folks in this country, are underrepresented in research, underrepresented in access to testing, underrepresented in access to care, while not using race in a genetic sense to try to mean something that it doesn't. How do we actually maintain our focus on learning what our genes can tell us while not allowing them to be used as servants of an old, hateful, racist ideology? And those are strong words, but this is a serious issue. So that brings me back again to this question of what are our genes saying about us? And is it true, right? Has anybody here done 23andMe and gotten a little surprise that you weren't really expecting? Like, really? <laughs> right? So one of the things that has been in the news a lot recently, and this brings me to another population that I work with quite a bit, as I mentioned, LGBT communities. Is anyone familiar with the story of Castor Semenya? See some hands? So Castor Semenya is a female runner from South Africa. She's been running and winning an international competition for years. Recently, she has come under a ban from the International Athletic Association because it was discovered that her chromosomes are XY. Castor Semenya is a woman. She has an intersex condition, but she is raised as a woman, identifies as a woman, knows herself as a woman. She has XY chromosomes. What is the truth? Who says that Castor Semenya is a woman? Does she do her genes? Or take me, for example. Who says that I'm a man? So I look pretty male. Many of you, some people know, many don't, that I'm actually transgender. I haven't had my chromosomes checked, but I can imagine what they might say. Who is to say whether I am a man, whether Castor Semenya is a woman, what do our genes say about it, about us, and how true is it? That's one of the biggest barriers for me as a transgender person in thinking about genetics and genomic medicine. I have always said that when I die, I want to be cremated because I don't want any researchers getting their hands on my bones long after I'm gone and coming up with some story about me that has nothing to do with who I actually am. In thinking about our identities as LGBT people, sexual orientation, gender identity, there's long been this search for the gay gene, search for a transgender gene. Some people would frame that as neutral, right? Kind of like the idea of looking for conditions that may be particularly prevalent in certain racial groups. But what we know is that those things can very quickly slide into efforts to erase us, to say that we shouldn't be here in the first place, to describe us as problems rather than people. 
So when you're talking about, for example, genomic medicine to LGBT community members, that's one of the first things that comes up. How will I know that the information that I share, the research that I participate in, won't be used to actually undermine my identity and erase my community? Thinking about parenting. For LGBT parents, same-sex parents, if I have children, I will have to adopt them. That adoption is a wonderful thing. And what does it say when we keep coming back to the idea that genetics is the foundation, is the truth of who we are? What does that mean about my children? What does it mean about the communities that many of us build outside of our biological families? What does it mean about the truth of our chosen families? So thinking all of those questions through as we come to this incredible moment in genomic medicine where we have evolved from you know, the sort of questions of how do we unravel the genome to how do we actually turn that into tools that we can use in our day-to-day -day lives that actually improve our health in an individual, personal, and incredibly powerful and important basis while not losing sight of this question or these questions that I started with. What does our genome say about us? Is it true? How do we own that information and who benefits from it? So as we go forward into this brave new world of genetic uh, revolutions and genomic medicine, I hope that these are questions that you all will keep in mind and I appreciate your attention and the opportunity to talk today. Thank you. I guess that means I'm to talk now. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, and, and uh, Gwen, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, another platform to share my journey and why I'm here. Um, I am a 15-year colorectal cancer survivor. And um, my journey through the cancer world was very, um, it was a difficult challenge. I was diagnosed at 35 years old um, and misdiagnosed for six months. And so as a result of that misdiagnosis, I wound up having a hysterectomy because that was presumed the issue. I had the issues of, uh, of constipation and blood in my stool and low blood counts, but still no one thought to test me for colon cancer because I was not the age of, the typical age of 45 being African American or 50. And so going through that journey and having the surgery, I kind of wind up having an emergency surgery once they found out that I did have colon cancer. I never left the hospital. And during this process, um, after my surgery, the doctor mentioned Lynch syndrome. And I was like, okay, you know, that didn't mean anything to me because I'm, I, I just found out I had cancer. So I'm trying to process the fact that I'm 35 years old. I was preparing for my first bodybuilding contest. So I, what they consider now eating clean. Um, so I, was, I had a diet of chicken, fish, and turkey. I have no idea what that means. Um, but, but I had a diet of chicken, fish, and turkey. And so to be diagnosed with cancer and to try to figure out where did this come from? And it wasn't explain to me what Lynch syndrome meant. So I just assumed that that was a gene, a gene and okay, I didn't know where, where it came from. My father was deceased. My mother was alive, but she didn't have it. Um, and later, 11 years later, my aunt, my father's only remaining sister, says, oh yeah, your father in the autopsy was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer. So that's 11 years that has gone by that I never knew that it was my father. But during this process also, I never knew that Lynch syndrome meant that there were mutations, that there was something I had to worry about with my children. And so none of this was explained to me. So I went home saying, oh, I have, a, I have Lynch syndrome. You know, I'm, you know you, you're saying you have Lynch syndrome, but as a patient, like, okay, that's a badge of honor. I got Lynch syndrome. But I didn't understand that that meant that my daughters, I had five girls, they all had to be tested starting at 24 years old. I didn't, I didn't know that. No one followed me through the process. I fell through the cracks. So everything that I've learned, I learned as a result of my journey. I learned because I wind up homeless trying to survive cancer with my five children. So these are lessons that have led me here today to start talking to other patients to advocate and ask questions. What does that mean? 
Today, I still don't know what my tumor marker is. I called back to find out what my tumor marker is. They can't even find the tumor. All that says on my file is Lynch syndrome. So what does that mean for me? My daughter got tested for pole E mutation. So I have to do genetic testing all over again so they can, ma they can match her gene. But as I went through my journey, I started talking to other patients and I started doing community engagement and realizing that patients in the minority communities were not even being offered genetic testing. No one offered me anything. They just let me go home. And I found out it was common. And not only was it common, it was one of those things where when I talked to another patient, I said, well, have you talked, have you found out what your gene mutation is? Have you had genetic testing? And she says, what's that? No one explained to her that she needed to have genetic testing. Um, I'm dealing with a family right now. The young lady was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer at 37 years old. Four sisters that are in, that were in the foster care system. The younger sister that was diagnosed with cancer was in denial. And when there was nothing left to do, she wound up going to another hospital. And the doctor that cared for her at this hospital was also a colon cancer survivor. The patient died within five days from sepsis. The other sisters, all of them are under 45 years old. No one said to them, you need to be tested. Her children need to be tested. And they're scared to death to be tested. No one has counseled them. And so I sat with them and said, we need to talk to the doctor that treated your sister so that we can talk about genetic testing. The doctor won't even return the phone call because the patient had Medicaid insurance, so she's not getting paid. These are issues that are happening in low-income communities. They can't get the respect from the medical community to see them as being viable people. Regardless of what insurance you have, genetic testing is something we all should have. We all have the opportunity to know what our life expectancy is. What are we passing on to our children? And see, we have, we have the conversation that we want to pass on certain legacies to our children. Let's have health be the first legacy we pass on. Because whether or not you leave family, to, you know, leave money to them or not, they can't spend it if they're not here. And so the conversations that I have in communities of color, and we also have this issue of keeping family secrets. So we at the Blue Hat Foundation have, have a tagline, family secrets kill families. What you don't tell your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your cousins, has the potential to kill your family lineage because we're not talking about it. And so because we have that historical issue of what goes on in our house, stay in our house, that's something that's killing families. And of course we know that's drug abuse, that's, um, you know, Babies out of wedlock, there's um, domestic violence. These are all things that are kept within minority communities that are secrets. But we have to encourage, and that's what we do. I'm telling my business because I want you to understand that what I wasn't told almost killed me. And so we also need to also be um, understanding of the fact that historically, historically, there are challenges within the African-American community because they do bring up the fact that Henrietta Lacks is a big issue in, uh, as to why they don't participate in genomic testing because of the Tuskegee experiment. And I, I explained that to a researcher once and he said, still? And I said, still? <laughs> you know, so that, that to me let me know there's a lack of empathy. So you have to have empathy if you want to have communities of color participate in genetic testing and clinical trials and research. We have to be empathetic to the issues that this community has experienced. And so that's why I continue to explain this, not only to researchers, but also to patients, that it's important for you to participate because it may not benefit you today, but it will benefit your children. And so we need to leave this legacy and benefits to our family. Um, but then there's other issues that families are dealing with. They're dealing with maybe they have a wayward child, maybe they have other issues going on, other health. If I have other health challenges, I don't care about your genetic testing because if it's not benefiting something that's gonna fix me today, what does it matter? That's an attitude that's happening. And so we have to be, we have to say, no, 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 no. We understand it may not help you today, but your participation is important. 
So we still have to continue to explain the challenges that you're, you're experiencing today. No, research may not help you today, but your research, you participating is important. Your genetic testing is important. Um, we did a survey with some of the patients that we participated, that participated, and they said that they were never even asked to do genetic testing. Not explain literacy. They're not understanding what it actually means. And then there are certain religious issues. There, there is a friend of mine who said he doesn't want to participate in genetic testing because he felt, excuse me, felt that they were preparing for genocide. So you have to understand there's religious barriers that people are struggling with. They're like, you're telling me this is good for me, but then my pastor is telling me that no, this is not, this is something that they're creating to break, you know, to, to break down the family. Exactly, exactly. So as much as we can sit here and talk about data, and one of the things that I really hate, I really hate the word data. And I'm gonna tell you why. <laughs> But you know what? Because I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Because, see, when you say data, it's easier for you to process and do the work that you need to do. But I want to remind you that behind the data, these are lives. These are people that are struggling, that are trying to find answers, that have experienced trauma and tragedies. And so when you think of data, I also want you to think about that that's someone's mother, that's someone's sister, someone's father. So it's not just data. And so when we make data relatable, we can work better. And I often say, I am the product of your research because I'm here 15 years later. So behind your data, I'm here. So see me not only as data, but as a life you've saved. And so when you look at data differently and change it and say, you know what? Behind what I'm doing, someone is going to survive a disease, an issue in life, a life challenge. Someone is going to find out their genetic, you know, mutation. And then also, for some reasons why people don't want to participate in genetic testing is because sometimes their personal issues of having an additional child that maybe their wife didn't know about or their husband didn't know about, or maybe you thought that was your cousin, and in reality, it's your sister. <laughs> so these are issues that are real issues as to why people don't want to participate. So it's well beyond, you know, financial. It's well beyond. There are a lot of issues, but it requires understanding and realizing that your invasion may actually break up families. So that's why people are looking at it this way. They're not necessarily opposed to it, but sometimes it might be personal business they don't want to get out. And so, again, it comes into it's far deeper than just I don't want to know. And then you do have patients that say, I don't want to know. I deal with patients all the time. I just don't want to know. I had a stage four patient. She did not want to know what her treatment was. She didn't want to know what her mutation was. She didn't want to know what her life expectancy was because she had checked out. And you have patients that are traumatized by their experience. They're checked out. And so your persistence may actually traumatize them more. And so sometimes we have to be patient and understand that, you know what? Okay, we'll try again another time. But still give the information and still relate the information that this is important. But we'll try again when you're able, when you're ready. Maybe today is not a good day. I myself, because of my daughters, I want to know as much about my genetic code as I possibly can. I want to make sure that when my daughters turn 24 years old, they're not diagnosed with colon cancer. My two older daughters, every time they've been tested, they've had two polyps. But if it wasn't for the fact that I was persistent in trying to learn more about what Lynch syndrome meant and what it meant for the health of my children, I wouldn't be here today. They wouldn't be here today. They both were tested positive. They both had two polyps, their first test. So can you imagine if we had not explored the possibility, they probably wouldn't be here. And so my being here as a patient, I'm representing the patient community and I'm sitting at the table with you to help take your information back to the patient community and to bring the patient community's information and concerns back to you so that we can work together in unity and encourage each one to be understanding of each community. 
we as the patient community need to be understanding that you're not trying to be invasive, but you're trying to be helpful. You're trying to help us live longer. You're trying to help us live better lives. But if we don't understand that, and if that doesn't come across and it's too aggressive, you're going to lose the patient community. So there is a necessity to be patient, to be empathetic, to be understanding, and to listen. Because sometimes a patient might tell you something, but if you're not listening, you'll miss it. So we as a patient community are grateful to what you're doing. We're grateful to your interest in trying to find out why things are, you know, the mutations of certain diseases and how we can save our families. And I hope that as we continue to do this, I'm able to continue to sit in front of you and to work with you. And so this is my slide, my last slide, <laughs> um, where I've worked very closely with the hospitals within the Chicago area in terms of talking with the community, doing community engagement and participating with, we have an event every year called Blue Hat Bowtie Sunday, where it raises awareness of colorectal cancer in minority and medically underserved communities and churches, where the churches all dress in blue. And we have the hospitals come out and offer free testing and free screenings for colorectal cancer. And so this is just our way of trying to have the community advocate more for themselves, ask questions and bringing the medical community to the patient so the patient has access. And so during the month of uh, Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, I saw that little cartoon and it reminded me of one of my daughters is, you know, that said, hey mom, where's the colon? Because we realize also too, that patients are not always aware of where organs are in their bodies. So when you're talking about certain things, they're looking at you like, I have no idea where that is. And I'm gonna be honest with you, before I was diagnosed with colon cancer, I didn't know that either. And I'm finding out that that's so, it's so common. So we have to also understand that patients may not understand what you're talking about and may be too afraid to say, I don't know what that means. So thank you so much for having me here. And I so appreciate being here and being able to share portions of my story. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have time for a few questions? Yeah. Yeah. So do we have time for some questions? Otherwise, I can start some things off. Well, so while people are uh, thinking about what they'd like to say, I, I um, uh, took a few themes from both of your presentations. Um, one is uh, front and center about what does your genome say about us? You both sort of approached it from different perspectives. And I, I'm curious, in this age of direct-to-consumer testing, precision medicine, where do you all see the future? of genomics and genetics going in terms of what that says about each of us. Any thoughts? Um, I see it being able to, before something happens, mm -hmm. letting me know that I may have this ticking time bomb. Mm -hmm. But there's, a, there's an opportunity to keep the time bomb from going off if I do A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. um, but I also see the future as maybe the opportunity to stop something before it starts. Mm -hmm. And you know, patients are um, more proactive because now I know mm -hmm. that this is, you know, this is a possibility. Now I can go and have, you know, maybe I'll have, um, I, I don't want to do, what do they call the, the, the Angelina Jolie effect? I mean, yeah. I don't want to go that far. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think it's very important that we understand what we have and then we're proactive and being able to say, you know what, the doctor said that I'm, I'm predisposed to colon cancer. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go and get my, my screenings, you know, and I'm able to take this certain type of medication for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I would love to see happen, that we participate more and medications are tailor-made for me and we're not just necessarily throwing medications out and say, look, let's see if it helps. Because I think the longer we prolong being able to save our own lives, the mm -hmm. worse something gets. And so that's, that's what I hope happens. Uh, for me, I think one of the things that I hope is a greater awareness of the commonalities that we have between us. You know, there's so many things these days, particularly in the media and in politics, that are used to divide us. Mm -hmm. And I hope that a shared understanding of just how similar we are, how all of the building blocks that make up our lives are the same mm -hmm. at this, you know, basic fundamental genetic level 
um, that's something that I hope will, will be a narrative that can help to counter a lot of the divisiveness and a lot of this idea that we are all of these separate groups and that we have nothing bringing us together in common. The one other thing that comes to my mind, I would, you know, as a health policy nerd, um, I wear that proudly. Um, I do like to say that data are stories, because right? I think that that is a really critical thing that's often lost, right? Both from the sense of the researchers not remembering that data actually are people's stories, mm -hmm. and for those of us who are being asked for our data, I mean, it's really, those are our stories. That is our voice. That is our way of sharing what's happening with us. Mm -hmm. But so when we think about a lot of the, tr the struggles that many of us are having with health insurance coverage and health care, you know, the big discussions just down the road here, mm -hmm. um, I hope that genomic medicine can be used as a lever to encourage more people to think really critically and proactively mm -hmm. about what it means to really have access to adequate coverage to the care and treatment that we need. Because there's so many ways, you know, even before it comes to the benefits of genomic medicine, so many of us and our families and communities are falling through the cracks of a system that's not set up for health. It's not set up to make sure that we have the resources that we need to be healthy. So I hope that genomic medicine can kind of be something that draws more people to the table to think about you know, as we're developing these exciting cutting edge pieces of, of healthcare and treatment, how do we actually make sure that we're, we're shoring up the foundations of that system overall? Yeah. Great. Would you all join me in thanking um, Candice, Kellen, and Carla for an incredibly, <laughs> incredible panel.